All right, welcome back. So this is going to be a whole lecture just on the domains eubacteria and archaea. Now I put these two together because they are very similar and there's going to be some minor differences, but I'm going to kind of spend more time talking about the eubacteria because this is what we know more about and, and a little bit more about a little bit about archaea because they're a little bit new to us and we're just learning more about them. Okay, so you've seen this before, but um, we talked about that one common ancestor, our universal ancestor right there, the very first cell. And I've always wondered, how did we get to all the components come together just right to get that first piece of life to come together? Now, regardless of what type of cell you are, if you're a prokaryote or eukaryotic, if, you're, if you are a eukaryotic cell, if you're a plant cell, an eye cell, a toe cell, or whatever, any kind of type of cell you are, you have, have to have several key characteristics. Now, I talked about these um, when I went over the cell in 1408. So one of the first one is a plasma membrane. So this is the outer covering, and it keeps pretty much everything inside. It's your cells, keeps that separate your interior from the exterior surrounding environment. You're going to have to have cytoplasm. That's like that jelly-like substance in the cell. It keeps all the goodies floating inside. You're going to have to have DNA. Remember, DNA is your instruction manual. It tells you everything. It has all your genes, which are like the recipes that for life. So you have to have DNA. Now, some cells are only going to have RNA. Remember, RNA is sim very similar to DNA. There's a few minor differences, but um, especially when we talk about viruses, um, which technically aren't living, they can have DNA or RNA within their cell. And then there's ribosomes. Remember, these are the protein factories. They are what they're going to make proteins. So proteins do so much in your cell. They're super important. So if you can't make them, you're pretty much going to be screwed. Now, the tree of life, which I kind of hit on a little bit on the classification lecture, because we have this one universal ancestor. And then as we went through and we get more and more diverse, and more complicated too. So you're gonna see here's a universal ancestor was very primitive. And then we started to break off the first branch, which was a true bacteria. They're gonna be prokaryotic and unicellular. And then next are the archaea bacteria. They kind of broke off next, still prokaryotic, no membrane bound nucleus, also uncelled organisms. But then we started to get a little more complicated. Eventually life got a little diverse. We started to get that membrane bound nucleus and those organelles. So we start to see the first eukaryotes, which are the protist. Now protist, when we talk about them, they're gonna be either uni or multicellular. And then we get a little more diverse. We get to the plants, then the fungi, and then top of the hierarchy right here, the animals. So it always makes you wonder, what did that first cell look like? You know, if, um, I was asked this weird question in one of meetings, you know, if there's something you could do, what would you want? And I'd love the time travel so I can see like different key parts of history. So I just want to be a observer. I don't want to change anything. I just want to see how it was. And I would love to see what the very first cell looked like because I'm a cell and molecular biologist. And it just fascinates me how this one universal ancestor led to all this diversity. So just a quick overview, it talks about the history of the Earth. She's actually quite old, about 4.7 to 4.8 billion years old. Now when we look at the history of the Earth, we can break it up into two big phases. So the first one is the chemical evolution. So this is where we had to get everything organized because at very first, it was a very hostile environment. Um, one show I love to watch that I really advise students to watch is Cosmos because I love it because it hit on everything. They'll talk about the history of the Earth and how things changed, and they go into biology, they go into chemistry, physics. It's just amazing. Astronomy, great show. Highly recommend it. It's like my Tuesday night thing because I have new episodes right now, but go back and watch it because you'll just fall in love with science all over again. Now, early off, we had this very harsh environment, but what we did is we had to get all the right molecules. So if you remember the macromolecules way back from 1408 unit one, you're probably going, oh my gosh. But we had to get the nucleotides. We had to get those initial protein um, amino acids. We had to get everything organized first. So when we had everything come together, we need to get to this first protocell. 
So how did everything come together? So if you remember, um, I talked about the Miller and Yuri experiment, and this is a group they actually just talked about on Cosmos like two weeks ago, is where they tried to mimic the very hostile environment of the Earth early on. So they used all the gas components of the atmosphere, some water, and what they did show was that they were able to form the first, um, some of these organic molecules, which are essential for forming all the key components of the cell. So this is a cool little video just to refresh your brain on it. I think it's cool that, you know, for me, if you want to say how did life form, I think put all the components in a dish and shake it up and then it should come together to form a cell, but I don't think it's that easy. Now, once we get all the chemical stuff taken care of, the first cell appears, and we're going to start to see the very first part of life. So purple right here is the prokaryote. So here's the first part of life right here. So for a long time, we just had these very, very, very simple organisms, just those prokaryotes. But then we're going to start to see something happen. Happen. They're going to start to go through the process of photosynthesis. So that's where you're using the sun to generate energy. And then what's starting to happen as they're going through the process of photosynthesis is the atmosphere starting to change. It's becoming more and more oxygen rich. When that happens, we start to see the first eukaryotes form, and we're starting to get more complex with those organelles. And with the eukaryotes, we're starting to see organisms forms that aren't dependent on the sun for energy formation. So we're going to get more and more diverse, and eventually we get to where we start to get multicellular life. Eventually we start to leave the waters, and we start to get to where we colonize the planet. You'll see the plants show up first, and then the, and then those the insects, and then we're starting to get more and more, you know, specific to where we are right here. Bacteria been around a long time. They have it figured out, and that's what the main thing I hope you appreciate from today is as simple as they are, they've been around a long time, and they know how to survive. Um, just something about them. They have been here for billions of years, and they know what they're doing. So with the prokaryotes, these are going to be your very simple cells. Remember, I call them your efficiency apartment. They're just going to have the basics to survive. It's just a single cell. Now, the key thing was there's no membrane-bound nucleus or organelles, but they had those four key components that I did talk about it. Now, there's two big domains, the bacteria and the archaea that are prokaryotes, and they do make up a majority of life on Earth, which I think that's kind of fascinating. Um, if you took the total biomass of all the prokaryotes, it's 10 times that of all eukaryotes, and you even have your own special population that is specific to you, that's on your skin, that's in your gut. You appreciate that I'm a little bit more today. Now, not all of them are good. Some do cause diseases, um, but some are beneficial. So we'll talk about that towards the end of the lecture. Now, these guys are essential to ecosystems, especially when we get to the ecology part. You're going to appreciate them a little bit more because they do a lot. They're going to recycle carbon and a lot of the different chemicals that we talk, the biogeochemical cycles. And they're also essential for decomposing dead organisms along with the fungi. Now, we use them a lot for different things. Um, we use the beneficial ones a lot for, uh, especially when it comes to food and how we generate other things like um, production of insulin. Now, this is probably one of the most boring labs you will ever do because when you look at these, this is what it looks like. These are colonies, but then each of these colonies are probably millions, thousands, and millions of individual bacteria. You have to have the high power microscope to look at them and they look like that, kind of boring to look at. So normally when you do the bacteria lab, sometimes you'll go and swap something and put it on a petri dish and let it grow. It makes you feel gross when you know how often you touch things. But they're kind of boring to look at, especially compared to some of the stuff you look at later on. So just uh, add me a little prokaryote real quick. So remember, they do have to have DNA. Now they keep their DNA composed in what we call the nucleoid region. So what they're going to have is that one circular chromosome, and they just kind of smush it up. They kind of just take it and smush it up into what we call the nucleoid region. Remember, no membrane-bound nucleus. Now they will have little circular pieces of DNA outside, and those are called plasmids. And 
these are where they really love to store those um, antibiotic resistance genes. And they can share these plasmids with each other like crazy. Um, it's how they can make a huge population that are resistant to bacteria or antibiotics really easily. Now, they do have that plasma membrane, but the one thing that's unique to prokaryotes is they're going to have a cell wall. And remember, these are simple organisms, but this gives them an extra layer of protection. It actually helps maintain their shape and free its dehydration. So the cell wall is going to be, boom, 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 outside their plasma membrane. It gives them an extra layer of protection. Now, depending if you are a bacteria or archaea, you'll have peptidoglycan if you're a bacteria, or peptido, pseudopeptidoglycan if you are part of the archaea. For the bacteria, they use um, components of the cell wall to help identify some. So if you ever heard of gram staining, if a thing is gram positive or negative, it is due to the amount of peptidoglycan in the cell wall. Now, outside that cell wall, they do have what's called a capsule, which is shown in red here. And most of the time, they use it for attachment, but also is another layer of protection, also prevents dehydration. Now, some of them are going to have methods to help them move. And this is going to, one example that's shown right here is a flagellum. It looks like a long little tail right there. Um, not all of them are going to have this. I think I have one slide just on movement, or maybe two of them. But there's different ways that these guys are going to move. But one way that they could do is by using a flagellum. Now, some of them are also going to have fimbrae. Are, they're also called pili on this picture right here. Look like little short little, little needles or little pieces of spaghetti sticking out. Um, they're going to use these for attachment to different organisms or for the process of conjugation, which is a way they share information with each other. Now, when we break them into shapes, there's like three main shapes that we kind of talk about. We're going to have the cocci, which are the spherical ones, the bacilli which are going to be more like the rod shaped. And then there's spirilla, which kind of look like, like actual spirals right there. Now I'm going to go through in these a little bit more detail and talk about the naming. So you, if you ever get sick and you get diagnosed with something, you kind of understand what it's going to, why it's named that way. There are some that can be irregular in shape. Um, like I said, this domain, these two domains are super diverse and there's no way we could talk about all the stuff in there, but we're just kind of giving you a broad overview today. So first off with the cocci, the ones that are circular. Now they might be oval or elongated or maybe flattened a little bit inside. Now bacteria, they're gonna go through the process of binary fission, which I'll hit on a little bit. But when they go through a divide, they can remain attached so they don't have to technically separate. And they do like to hang together. Maybe, you know, being alone is not the way they like to be. So they like to hang out together and remain attached. And we use this attachment and the number of them to help determine, you know, to give them some identity. And now how they're attached, the different shapes are formed, you'll see like the different groups. So there's diplococci, which are just two of them. If you have a long train, it could be streptococci. Um, they can divide on different planes and form these tetrads. Um, they can go form these little further groups, the sarcinae, and then they can form like a multiple planes and form these grape-like clusters, which are called cyclococci. Now, the bacilli are a little bit different. Remember, these are your rod-shaped guys. They can only divide across their short axis, so they're just going to form these little chains right there. So we have a single one. We could have a diplo, so die for two. Strep will be a longer chain. And then there's some that are going to be the little short chubby guys, which are the coxillobacillus. It's like if you took a, a single bacilli and a cocci and they had like a little love child together. So they're like, kind of like an intermediate shape between each of them. And the spirals, these like to be by themselves pretty much. They're going to look like um, these little curved rods right here. Um, they can have the spiral, which are more of a hel helical shape, and then the spiral, which is a little bit more um, bent when it comes down to the um, looking at the physical appearance of it. So a lot of words here, but there are some cool videos to kind of go through. And I want to talk a little bit about movement because you think about bacteria, they're just sitting on a dish. But, you know, it's not just land and hope you land on a food source. They have to get, get around. Now, as I mentioned in the very beginning, some do have a flagella. So one of the most common methods is by using that flagella. It's like a, like a little tail and they whip around the cell to move around. 
Now, some of them are going to have a single leg or they're going to have a small cluster. And it's going to rotate like, like a propeller on a boat engine. So this is a cool little video. It's, it's not it's, um, someone that generated. But if you go to the 30-second mark, you can actually observe this. It's a computer image generated to kind of show you the movement of those. It's kind of cool. You can watch all of it. But it's kind of showing you the flagellum and how they use it for movement. Now, remember, these guys are very simple, so there's no brain to supply motivation. So they have to find different ways because the food's not going to fall in their lap. They have to get there. Um, they also have to move because um, there's going to be different signals or things in the environment. So they use this process called chemotaxis, and basically it's going to be involuntary. So this is where you're going to use tugs and pulls in the environment to take them to useful places. Um, there's different ways you can use it. Um, there's chemicals. Some of them respond to um, actual uh, phototaxis, um, responding to light. But when it comes to this, they don't have a direct determination where they're going to be going. Um, when they go through the process of chemotaxis, they're just going to keep randomly moving until they tumble into something. A lot. Of, this is called random walking so if there's no taxes right there they're just going to keep like imagine if you like close your eyes and you're walking around in a space you don't know you're just going to keep bumping into stuff and eventually hopefully you'll land into something that's helpful and you won't hurt yourself so this is called random walking and this is a video where they actually tracked bacteria doing this random walking all over the place and you can see it's just like a hot mess it's like watching a toddler run all over the room Now, sometimes they use other methods to move around. So I have the hook right here. So remember those fimbrae, those little pili, to help move along a surface. Um, the fimbrae, they use them mostly for reproduction, but they can also use for movement. And people often confuse them with cilia that you'll see later on. But think about them, they kind of like attach them on, and then they can kind of pull themselves towards something. Um, and it kind of helps them move around. They can kind of like kind of propel themselves, not as much with the flagellum, but they kind of get all the little hairs moving in one time. Um, this is a video kind of showing that. And like technically it's a protus, but it does show you like the movement of all using all the little fimbrae together for movement. Now bacteria, as you saw some of the previous slides, they don't like to just be by themselves. They don't just seek out food, but they seek out each other. They like to be in a group. So what they'll do, they form these things called biofilms sometimes. So what they do is they form this thin matrix, and they're stuck together. So what happens is you get a few get together, and they have these different stages that they could form. First is uh, attachment. We get this microcolony, and they get together. And they start to form this matrix, like this goop that's all together with themselves. And what they have is this film that starts to form between them. And then sometimes some other species form too, and they form what's called this biofilm. And that keeps growing. And it's this colony of these different bacteria coming together, and it's just this slime. And it provides some protection for us, and eventually the slime thing goes and matures, and eventually gets to a certain point where some of us are like, well, I'm going to leave off and form my own new location, and it will detach and form like a new space right here. Now, the purpose they form these biofilms um, allows for them to communicate with each other. There's protection in numbers. Sometimes they use it for reproduction, and they can actually get specialized structures through these biofilms. Kind of cool. Now with reproduction, they're going to go through this process of binary fission, so you go from one cell to two. Now this is a form of asexual reproduction, which means they are making clones of themselves. So they are not going through the process of sexual reproduction where we take the egg and sperm come together, where we mix the genetic material from two individuals to form a new one. This is just like putting yourself in the copy machine and putting an exact new copy of yourself coming out. Now, sometimes mutations happen in copying of the DNA, but most of the time, like this cartoon says, you're just copying yourself over and over again, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. Now, binary fission is quite simple when you look at it. So you're going to have this cell right here. First thing you're going to do is you're going to copy your chromosome. Boom. And you also copy those plasmids, too, because you want to make sure you're giving a nice copy to those cells. It's going to start to elongate. 
and eventually it's going to start the pinch in at what we call the septum. That new cell wall is going to form, and eventually we just split. Now, quite simple, really it is. You know, it's just a matter of copying it and then elongating it. Now you're dead to two. Now, bacteria have really figured this out. So here's a video of showing a time lapse of um, colonies of bacteria forming. And it's kind of scary when you think about them. So prokaryotes, since they're very simple organisms, can actually divide really fast. Their generation time is really quick. Um, for humans, you think a generation time would be about 20 years. For bacteria, 20 minutes. So by the time you've listened to this lecture, a whole new generation of bacteria could have divided and formed. Um, some of them are as fast as 17 minutes. Some of them take about 12 hours. So think about that. You know, if you're just watching a TV show for an hour, that's three new generations of bacteria that can form, which I find that fascinating. Really, it is. Now, they're fast multipliers. And that means that population can go really rapidly. Um, the, the population growth can just go and go and go. And depending on that, if they have the right resources, they can just keep growing and growing and growing. Um, once the resources run out, maybe growth will slow a little bit. So this is a little cartoon video. So I always think about finals time. Y'all are always sick. Anytime it's exam. So anytime y'all are turning stuff in, I seriously lice all the crap out of it. Um, this video is what I think about what your papers are doing, like I said, and this is all of us right now, especially um, with COVID. I'm amazed. I wondered if people really weren't washing their hands or what they were doing before all this happened because it was amazing how soap was so hard to find. But, you know, now you kind of understand what's going on with these guys and why they are, really should be feared. Now, one way that you ensure survival, and they've been around for billions of years, is thanks to genetic diversity. So this is the key to survival. Um, if you can't adapt to your changing environment, the environment's going to keep changing. It's going to leave you behind. So you have to make these changes. Now, prokaryotes have been around a long time, and they know how to adapt. They are the best at it. That's why we have so many antibiotic-resistant bacteria out there, because they just figured it out. It's like... Oh, good luck with that one. Um, I know we watched the video where we had the Petri dish and we had the different levels of bacteria resistance to the different levels. It got more and more concentrated and it took like days for them to get to a thousand times the concentration. It's really interesting. So once you figure out how to survive, you need to share that information with your friends. You know, there's well, no point in keeping it to yourself. It's, it's, survival is better in numbers. So they'll go through different processes where they can share information. Now, the first one is transformation. This is where you just take up a random piece of DNA floating in the environment. It's this middle one right here. So if you think about it, it's just like, oh, there's something right there. You pick it up. Bacteria are kind of like hoarders, you know? If they see that, it might be beneficial to them. Let me pick that up and keep it right there. You never know. So that's just transformation. Now, transduction is DNA is accidentally, so you didn't mean to do it, moved from one bacterium to another by a virus or a bacteriophage. So this was given to you. You really didn't want it. Because viruses, when we talk about them, it'll be more unit four. They're actually not living. And the only way they can survive is they have to infect the host cell and take over their machinery. So when they do that, they're going to bring DNA with them. And then not all bacteria die from infection. And then they're stuck with extra viral DNA as a response from being infected by the virus. Another way they can share information with you, there's a process of conjugation. So this is where we transfer it between cells, and that was using those fembrae that we kind of talked about earlier on. So it's just a transfer between two bacteria directly. So when you think about them, uh, they always get a bad rep. You think of bacteria, you think of dirty. You just want to go and wipe down all your counters with bleach and Lysol and everything. But they can be quite helpful. Um, now, they're very essential for food processing, bread, yogurt, cheese production, a lot of great things out there that we need thanks to bacteria. Um, we use them for a lot of pharmaceuticals and dietary supplements. We use them to make a lot of things. Um, genetic engineering, when I talked about how we can use bacteria to mass produce insulin. I talked about that last semester. Um, if you want some more information about that, just let me know and I can send you the slides or a link to a good video. We use it for bioremediation. So this oil spills, it seems we haven't had a really bad one lately, but maybe there has been. Well, 
no, there was one. I forgot where it was, but we used bacteria to help clean them up. I think it was Indian Ocean, I'm not quite sure, but we used bacteria to help clean up these oil spills. You do have this huge population that is essential for you for digestion. So, you know, when Jane Lee Curtis tell you to go eat your, your um, yogurt, it has a large, you know, restore that population of bacteria in your stomach. Um, some animals have to have that, um, especially ruminants, um, which are like your cows, your sheep, um, camels, but multiple, they have four stomachs. And they have to have a bacterial population to help them break down the cellulose and all of the stuff in plants. Now, most of the time, you do have this great commensalism relationship where neither the host nor the bacteria are harmed. Where both of them are benefits. They're just kind of living together in harmony. And you always have your little bacterial population with you in your guts. Um, there's anywhere from 10 to 100 times as many prokaryotic cells in and on us, so not, not just inside you, but on your skin as well, well um, as you do normal body cells. So you're never alone. You always have your biome with you. So anytime you're thinking, oh, there's no one around me, there is someone there to scare you. Now, they have so many beneficial things, but they can be quite bad. Now, some of them are pathogens. They cause diseases. Now, it took us a while to figure out how to really learn about sanitation and how we can reduce the spread of pathogens. That's why you saw a lot of plagues early on. So this is a video that talks about the bubonic plague. And it was quite interesting because, you know, they didn't quite figure out what was causing it, the spread, and all the other stuff. And then once they figured out how to increase sanitation and care and all the other stuff, we started to see it go down. So this is a good video. It talks about the history and how sometimes it comes back. You know, it's not completely gone. Now, antibiotic resistance. So this is when we, um, I think I talked about it. It's a discussion post in 1408 where we overuse them. Um, I talk about how um, some people go to the doctor for everything. Well, bacteria, like, well, you keep giving us stuff to kill us. But let's figure it out and fight back. So, you know, you do have your immune system, and we'll talk about that and how your body creates your immune system to combat different types of bacteria and viruses. But sometimes I think we're kind of giving them an advantage by showing them all our cards. And that's led to the rise of superbugs. So here's an article that talks about it and a video as well. So if you're kind of interested in that topic, these are kind of cool. Um, you're going to do an activity where there's going to be an outbreak of a certain type of pathogen in a hospital. And it's a very deadly one. And you're going to come up with different ways of new methods of how you can prevent the spread. Um, it's kind of a cool one. I did as a, a group project last semester. And I thought that was more fun than looking at boring slides. So I'll talk about it um, when I do the weekly update. Now, bacteria and viruses have this long battle that they've been going through for years and years and years. Now, viruses. <laughs> They do have DNA, but they're not considered living. So sad, you know. So they have to find a host. And what they do is they inject their DNA into the host, and they take over all the replication ma uh, machinery. Now, bacteria and viruses have done this battle a long time ago. Viruses have really taken advantage of bacteria. So bacteria kind of got figured out. It's like, hey, this isn't cool. So they decided to find a way to fight back. And that's the whole development of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Um, we figured this out. We figured out bacteria were using it. And now we use it in science. So if you remember the whole designer babies um, post and the people that discovered the CRISPR-Cas9 system actually just got the Nobel Prize for it, which is really cool. Yay for women in science. So this whole system has been around for years, and we just figured it out, and now we're using it to benefit us in the long run. So when it comes to naming all this, there's a lot out there. I'm not going to go through the specific groups. I'll show you on the next couple of slides all the examples. So you're going to find a large variety in the domains eubacteria, which are, boom, right here. Um, these are some of the bigger groups. On the next slide, you'll see um, a little bit more detail about them. Now, there's some controversy about how many technical groups there are. Um, there's about 41 accepted phyla for this LPSN and 89 for this other database. Um, it's all over the place. Um, the main thing that you should know is the domain bacteria or true bacteria 
the Arcadians, they're going to be the extremophiles. Um, they like the more harsh environments. They are a prokaryote, but use and unique about them is we started looking at them a little bit closer is they use enzymes for transcription and translation, which are very similar to what eukaryotes do. So they have been determined to be more closer of an ancestor related to the eukaryotes and the true bacteria. So lots of small words right here, but this is just showing you some of the bigger phylum of the different type of bacteria and some of the different organisms. Some names that you might know, um, E. coli, so that has caused a lot of disease. Um, salmonella is another one. So here's your, this is the bad group right here. You don't want to hang out with this group right here. Um, Halobacter pylori, like I said, um, chlamydia. This all, see, like why do you need those many C's and O's right next to each other? But this is just going showing you like some of the different groups. Um, anthrax, here's like you can see, you know, this is just a little bit more information for you if you want to study some about the specific groups. And then here's a little bit more about the archive. This is pulled from the OpenStax for the Majors book. Um, it's not in your book, but if you'd like more information, please let me know and I will send it to you. But that's going to wrap up bacteria. Um, here's some review slides on it. Uh, there's a lot of cool information out there. Like I said, I just want to keep it kind of broad. I don't want to go into too much detail with it. And one, two, and two. And those are all my credits for all the pictures. So I'm going to stop this one right here.